Uh, we are coming here to do a survey. Uh, we are looking for birds to breed here. These birds are very sensitive. Please uh, be careful here. Oh, there is an old nest right here. It is from last season. It is not used this year. Probably they are breeding a bit more further. Gnome Weiss is checking the nests of Persian bee-eaters in the Negev desert. It's a species that disappeared from Israel 50 years ago and has just reappeared. The blue cheek beater is a critically endangered species, a breeding species in Israel. And this is one of the only places you can find them breeding uh, safely. We have to keep this location uh, quiet. We don't want people to come here and disturb the birds. Gnome finally spots a nest where the birds seem to be breeding. His protective measures have obviously paid off. Gnome insists that we don't reveal any information that could identify this place. But in this desert landscape where everything looks the same, what detail could possibly distinguish this spot from another? And then suddenly... Uh, there is a passage of raptors, a few thousands of honey buzzards. I need to make a phone call, just a second. Shachar? Shachar? Ma kore? Gnome informs the ornithological center of the bird's arrival. Yeah, they are just passing like this, gliding and circling, thermaling right up there on the way to Africa. Bird watchers stationed throughout the country report the passage of migratory birds and the information is sent back to air traffic controllers. Planes are kept on the ground, and those in flight go round to make way for the birds. The Jordan Rift Valley cleared of traffic, the raptors continue on their way without having been worried for a single moment. Oh, it's pretty amazing. To survive, these birds travel up to 10,000 kilometers from Europe, Asia, and Africa a perilous journey during which many lose their lives. Intensive poaching, electrocution and the increasing scarcity of food sources is to blame for this. But during their passage through the skies of Israel, the birds get all the consideration they deserve, having priority over men and their machines. years ago, the Arabian tectonic plate and the African plate separated, creating a gigantic depression in the ground called the Jordan Rift Valley. A 600-kilometer-long corridor that begins in Lebanon and descends to the Red Sea. The two sides of this channel belong to different countries, Israel and Jordan. When the sun rises, its rays heat the stones and the sand of the valley. Cold air descends and warm air rises, creating thermal lift. All the birds need to do is spread their wings to glide along inside this vertical elevator, one of the most important migratory routes in the world, used by a billion birds each year. Above our skies, right here, is an enormous flyway of birds, but none of them live here. They come from Europe and Asia on their way to Africa, and later on, on their way back. So this flyway, which is just above our hand, is actually a bottleneck. It's the only land bridge connecting by land three continents. Small birds like the chiffchaff or the willow wobbler, and at the same time, the storks, the steppe eagles, the pelicans, that can be up to 10 kilograms, 
still use the same route over the desert. But the birds have to face a terrible natural rampart on this migratory route, the Sahara Desert. And so, for millions of years, they have stopped at the tip of the Red Sea, in a low forest covering only 13 square kilometers, where they can find seeds, insects and water, a necessary break during which they can refuel and give themselves a chance of surviving the ordeals of migration. An oasis that has now disappeared, literally wiped off the map and replaced by a seaside resort, the city of Eilat. Buildings, roads, all along the coast. A paradise for man, perhaps, but not for nature and animals. Okay. We're following Amnon Han, known here as Mr. Swift. As soon as one of these birds is found in difficulty, Amnon intervenes. This fledgling probably flew out of its nest for the first time in its life, but due to lack of space between the buildings, it landed directly on this terrace. Amnon needs to get it examined. With the box wedged between his T-shirt and his shirt, he takes it away in his swift bulance. Amnon hits the road, Israeli style, fast, always fast, and with a tendency to use the horn non-stop. His destination is the Ramat Gan Zoo in Tel Aviv, which is also a gigantic hospital, upon which all the injured wild animals in the country converge. One of the departments here is exclusively devoted to migratory birds. The swift is taken care of immediately. Next to it, a European nightjar is under observation. Birds arrive here from all over the country, like this honey buzzard, which flew into a power line in Eilat. It will recover after a stay in the hospital. Once recovered, the birds can resume their migration across the skies of Israel. Why was the Eilat forest this oasis in the middle of the desert raised. In 1947, the creation of Israel led to the Arab-Israeli war. Israel seized the Negev desert, angering the neighboring countries. Tsaal, the Israeli army, then built bunkers along its border to protect itself. And so they could see the Arab soldiers coming, the army raised this small forest facing the sea. Without knowing it, the army had just triggered a bird apocalypse. From the 1950s to the 1980s, migratory birds preparing to cross the Sahara or returning from it no longer found any food. They died of hunger and thirst. Nearly 90% of migratory birds disappeared, an avian holocaust. Their song vanished from the Jordan Rift Valley to be replaced by a deathly silence. From the heights of Eilat, it's possible to take in Israel, Jordan, Saudi Arabia and Egypt at a single glance. This is where we find Shmulik Tagar, his shirt open to the navel, a silver scarab beetle around his neck, ray-bands on his nose. Shmulik looks like a former rock star on vacation. His instrument, ecology. So in the end of the 70s, we start making calculation of the numbers of birds and we understood that if we're not going to give them enough food for the way from Eilat to Africa and the same way back to Europe, then we got a big problem. We can hurt the migration. I decided that we have to solve the problem by 
giving them substantial place for food. We have a big garbage dump. We cover the garbage dump with sand. We put three meters of, of gravel, of sand. We plant on top of it small uh, vegetation, local vegetation. Everything that was here before, we did not put something new. And then uh, we, we, we gave them some water because there is no water here. It's water from uh, the sewage after being clean. And we put fish inside, small fish, big numbers, and they grow. At the end of the 80s, we had something like 20,000 small bushes and trees. Today we have about 37,000. But it was big, there was a lot of insects, and the bird went on to it, and the migration keep on going to Africa. By requisitioning part of the city's water for the forest, Schmulik alienated the elected officials who saw it as a waste of scarce resources. Speculators, eager to build more hotels, joined the protests. I saw that many people are putting their eyes on this piece of land because I was municipality and because I was nature man. I managed to declare it as a public land. While nature had been swept away from the shores of the Red Sea, Schmulik succeeded in imposing his vision of a cohabitation between man and birds, thanks to his sanctuary. Fifty years after its creation, this place is one of the most popular with bird watchers around the world. It's here, near the city of Eilat, right next to the Jordanian border, that we find Noam Weiss, the director. Every day begins with an inspection of the premises. From an old rubbish dump was born an oasis with more than a hint of paradise about it. The first rays of the sun filter over the high mountains of Jordan. It's time for the birds to emerge from their slumber, hundreds of species. Even Freddy, the only black flamingo in the world, has arrived. The conservationists didn't confine themselves to restoring the short, sparse, arid vegetation of yesteryear. They managed to create an entire forest on the scorching shores of the Red Sea. The sanctuary now provides the birds with the means to complete their ancestral migration. Every morning we open the nets at first light and we do it for four hours only. Each net is uh, located in a different habitat, so this way we can also uh, record what uh, habitats migratory birds use as uh, their stopover site. So this one is located in a salt marsh. This was actually the original habitat of Elat, so it's restored a habitat now. That's a house sparrow. It's a male, probably young, born this year. This is actually sedentary. It stays here all year round. They are now extracting a Sardinian warbler, which is a wintering bird here. But a lot of them are migrating to an unknown southern destination from here, maybe to Saudi Arabia. They're going to place it in the bag so they stay safe. Every 45 minutes, we are checking the nets uh, to make sure that all the birds are fine and to extract them so a bird is not waiting for too long. Oh, it's the white-breasted kingfisher. It's actually also eating uh, even birds and reptiles and mice and sometimes also fish. They only come here for the winter.
So this is where the birds are examined. This is our ringing station. The birds are placed according to the habitat it was caught in, and Iris will be conducting the ringing. The kingfisher plays dead during its examination, hoping to deceive the ornithologists. The physical condition is actually the reason why we trap these birds. We are trying to understand if these birds have enough fuel, enough fat to cross the Sahara Desert, make it safely, and after examining many birds, we have a lot, lot of statistics, we can actually say if uh, we should change something in our uh, bird sanctuary maintenance. Every bird is kept for just a few seconds, no, not more than needed, and it's ready to go. To restore the original habitat that was here, the salt marsh, we are flooding large areas with salty water. Its salinity is about a half of the sea, and we just put it into the vegetation. It will stay here for about a week, and then I move it to another part, and this way all this habitat, the salt marsh, is flourishing, is created. We started this salt marsh about two years ago. It was empty, and now look how beautiful it is, and so many birds use it as stop oversight. We didn't plant any trees. These are all the seeds that are originally in the ground. This tree is called the Christ thorn. It's the same plant that was on Jesus' head. It's the original one. It blooms in autumn. So a lot of birds are feeding on this uh, sweet flower set. At the time of its construction, Schmuluk was already aiming for the sanctuary to become autonomous by attracting tourists and nature enthusiasts. This has now happened. Eilat welcomes thousands of visitors every year to see the migratory birds. <laughs> it's a new bird for Israel. <laughs> We've just caught uh, something which is uh, coming from deep Siberia, probably the chestnut bunting, but we still need to check. First time for me to see such bird. See, it's very yellow on the belly, this beautiful mask, uh, which is chestnut, and look at the beautiful rump here. We will start the identification. We are on the clock right now because uh, we have to release it in one hour. <laughs> Birds were always a very important part of my life. I don't even know why, but I just feel I want to protect them. It all started at a visit to the, to the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. My grandparents, uh, they wanted me to become religious, so they took me to pray on Fridays, but I didn't care about that. The only thing that caught me was the swifts flying into the wall. I was just stunned. They are nesting in the, in the crevices. It's a holy place, but what was holy for me was actually the bird. The way they fly is just, just unimaginable. They caught me, and I think they got my heart right there. It was a moment. And since then, I just love seeing them, and I want to protect them. This is what I dedicate my life for.
But the wall that marks the border between two religions is the subject of permanent tensions. While we are filming, fighting breaks out and the infernal cycle of hatred resumes. Amnon Khan, Mr. Swift, thinks that the birds that live on this wall can inspire better feelings. As with these refugee children, whom he invites to discover nature. He encourages the presence of these birds in the city by installing nesting boxes on buildings. We began with this box of six uh, nesting boxes and then we added more and expanded more and expanded more. Amnon would like to make the installation of nesting boxes systematic in modern buildings in the center of Tel Aviv. Integrating nature into the city is the pet subject of Amir Balaban, co-founder of the Jerusalem Bird Observatory, located in the heart of the ancient city. There's no line between nature and cities. They interact. And if you understand this interaction, you might be able to solve larger problems of biodiversity loss, of uh, climate and environmental challenges that we're facing, and not less important, social problems. Because if we can bring people together around birds, you see our young volunteers, older people, Arabs, Jews, Christians, they're all interested in birds here. They're just sitting watching the birds in the bird eye. There are about 10 schools all around us, so we have every morning kids coming over learning about bird migration and uh, physiology and flight and, and, and nesting and a lot of exciting things. And we developed a, a little economy that's based on science, education and community work. At the end of the day, in order for us to be a resilient society, a resilient species, we have to start understanding how to work together and start working with nature in order to survive and not only to survive but to have a quality of life because you can see how how peaceful how serene how how fun it is to be here Jerusalem is one of the oldest cities in the world and it interacts with nature for thousands of years so for us, it's very important to develop the tools that show how we can coexist with nature in our buildings, in our landscaping, and even how we behave in nature. So this facility is one of the most important laboratories we have. And here we develop the tools that will enable us to survive in the upcoming challenges that we're facing. We are basically situated in an oasis, and you can see how the city is developing very intensively all around us. But we have to have measures to mitigate this uh, negative process. In Jerusalem, there is another space dedicated to biodiversity, the Gazelle Park, created in 2015 in the heart of a saturated urban space. Once we let nature do its course, for the last uh, six years, it's been a miracle seeing everything flower and, and develop. And the gazelles from three individuals are now numbering over 100 individuals. This is why this year we set aside 20 gazelles to be relocated in nature reserves all over the country. OK, and there they are. Look at them. And this male has about... Uh, 30 females, it's a harem of 30 females. The idea is to work on uh, urban wildlife and if we protect large tracts of land like Gazelle Valley Park, we also help the birds. One of the big success stories of Gazelle Valley Park is the big uh, wetland that, that we created here and after Three years of operation, we got a steady population of breeding ferruginous duck, which is a red-listed bird in Israel and in the world. So it shows that if we work with nature in cities, we can not only help the local environment, but also help protect endangered species. The gazelle, the, uh, the Palestine mountain gazelle, 
is uh, an endangered species. There are only 5,000 gazelles in the world. That's less than tigers. Although humans have marked the Middle East with their bloody conflicts for millennia, today's conservationists are not short of ideas for bringing peace. We are now in an Israeli old military post uh, next to the Jordanian border. You can see how close the border is. It's just 50 meters from us. In uh, times of war, this was used by the army as a protection against bombardments and to make sure the Jordanians don't arrive here. We have to be silent here. Just be careful from snakes. Follow me. There are about 60 or 70 or 80 of them right here. And most of the bunkers on the Jordanian border is pretty much the same. During the night, these bats are foraging in date plantations and eating pests that pesticides cannot kill. So these bats are actually giving a very important agroecological service for the farmers here. And we are now trying to find ways how to use this service to the benefit of the farmers, how to make it more and more uh, uh, to enhance the service. So this is not only a beautiful animal, it is also very helpful for the human activities around here. In the past, bats were hunted or killed in exchange for bounties, but recently, Israel has made a radical ecological shift. The usefulness of bats has been scientifically proven and almost all species are now protected. But there's a problem. The natural environments where they lived have since become agricultural land. And this is where Jessica comes in, an agroecologist who is none other in the city than Noam's wife. My main goal is to help the farmers, to help them uh, with biological uh, pest control, for example. I want them to be working with nature and be closer to nature and um, not to have the feeling that they have to fight nature all the time. So yes, there are pests uh, which are also coming from nature sometimes, but there are also a lot of um, control agents, so to say, like the ones that e actually eat the pests. Um, and we know that we have a lot of birds uh, coming through here in migration season, and um, they need to fuel up, they need proteins, so they are um, a good uh, option for uh, pest control. And we also have the bats here, the local bats, 16 species of insectivorous bats, and they don't need anything else but uh, insects. Nets are spread out to catch the bats and find out what species are present in the field. We do not just study what is around, but also how to improve the habitat for them, how to encourage them to be around in higher numbers and do um, more feeding in the fields to attract them to the right sites, to attract them in the right time and the farmers actually need the help and so on. So it's like uh, working, it's a it's a win-win situation for both sides, for the bats and for the farmers. Bats have a better habitat and the farmers have more biological pest control. An eco-location specialist completes the team of researchers. Jessica and her team will collect information and especially excreta. In fact, it's the droppings that will make it possible to know which bats eat the insects that ravage the fields. Oh, perfect. In the light of these results, farmers will be able to develop their land to encourage the presence of identified bats. These nocturnal predators will naturally eliminate insects that destroy crops. 
Bad luck. Tonight, the team catches nothing but Egyptian fruit bats, frugivores. But research has already yielded positive results. Many farmers have chosen to invite bats to stay on their farms. No longer considering the animal as a problem, but as an advantage, is a reality in Israel. A moral phenomenon to which a young generation driven by new knowledge aspires. Nora Lifshitz is the perfect illustration of this. She's going on a mission to an abandoned building in the city of Ashkelon, 10 kilometers from the Gaza Strip. Founder of the Israeli Bat Protection Association, Nora has been called in by the city council, which would like the bats squatting the premises to be gently removed before renovation work begins. Nora, known as Batgirl here, is perfectly at ease in this haunted house. Along the way, she picks up an injured bat that she will bring back to her sanctuary. They don't want to ruin the building, they want to re reconstruct the building. This is why it became more com uh, uh, complete, because if they ruin the building, we can take them out and there is no building, because they want to reconstruct it because it's beautiful. The problem is that bats really love their home. So they will try to come back for, I think, something like months. The real solution, it's not, it's, it's actually a pretty easy solution, but most contractors doesn't want to work with the bed. Um, we will close the room, every day several of rooms, and then we'll do a break for a couple of days to let the beds um, to reorganize themselves. It just takes time, but it's like, for, for the job, it's easy. You just take, like, devil and, um, and board and close rooms, that's it. The council has given her free reign to choose the contractor who will carry out the work. Nora knows that the bats will take up residence in the nearby palm trees, as this species likes to do. The amazing thing that you can smell, it's a sweet smell because they eat fruit and fruit are sweet, so also their poop is sweet. This is what you're smelling, it's sweet smell. I love it. Welcome to Nora's house, a poultry farm converted into a bat sanctuary. The bat recovered from the building is placed under observation. I started alone in one room apartment in Tel Aviv. I started like with one bat in my place and I thought, okay, I will help bats, but how many bats will be? And I thought maybe like in one year I have 13 bats. And then in three months, in my apartment, it became 90 bats, like nine zero bats, all around one bedroom apartment. And then I understood that I need to do something bigger. So I said, okay, I will find, I will ask money from people to open a, like a fundraise or something. And no one will give me because it's Israel and nobody loves animals and nobody loves bats. But I know that I did what I needed to do. So I asked, and then I don't know why, but people gave me money. Then I stuck with money, I said, okay, now I need to actually to build a place. So I came here and started building the first sanctuary for bats in the Middle East. And I don't know, this is what I do since then. I have amazing volunteers. They're like super, super um, patient with me because I, I can get really mad really fast. But I have, I think, something like 300 volunteers all around the nation. Uh, 14 foster homes, five or four emergency houses, around 12 or 13 clinic, vet clinic. They're helping us for free when if someone found a vet, you can put them here, there until we come.
I start alone, I don't feel alone. Even when I'm here, like I'm walking alone, I do this all day, every day, alone. I don't feel alone. Hello. Contacted 24 hours a day to help bats in difficulty all over the country, Nora also provides an online advice service and organizes repatriations with her team of volunteers. Hi. Have you come from work? Hello, you. Did you vocalize? Hmm? Did it make any sound? No. No sooner has it arrived than the injured bat starts communicating with the other residents of the sanctuary. She's fine. She just needs like a couple of days and love and food and that's it, I think. I grew up in a normal home, uh, super normal, too normal with money and shit like that. And then I decided that I do not like that. So I left home. I started to do a lot of um, mess around. And then I went, to, I went. They sent me uh, to a juvenile facility since I was uh, 12. Yeah. And then in the age of 18, I uh, got out. Very mad, very uh, scared, very shocked, uh, so I was in the street for a while. Then my dog found me and she rescued me. It was only natural that this big-hearted activist should want to rescue man's most unloved creatures. In 2015, I think it was, I spoke with the Wildlife Hospital. They get in one year 60 bets, six zero bets in a year. Today, 2021, I think we are, I get seven new bets every day. Seven. It means there is bets that need help. There are people that actually want to help them, but they never know what to do until we arrived. This is my life. <laughs> What can I do? <laughs> In Israel, fruit and vegetable merchants pay a religious tithe of 10% of their produce, produce that usually ends up being thrown away. Nora has been fighting for the right to recuperate some of this for her sanctuary. Yeah, it's fun to be here, like you can see. The glorious life of an uh, NGO founder, yep. Food is one of the major issues in the protection of migratory birds. During the development of Israel, large wetlands were developed for fish farming. By appropriating these spaces, man deprived migratory birds of their resources. Hungry pelicans rushed to the fish farms to steal fish and were greeted with gunfire. The state has therefore had to find solutions for the 50,000 pelicans that cross the skies of Israel each year. Oad Hatsufe is one of those responsible for protecting the pelicans Every day, he has to find supplies of unsold live fish and transport them by road. Wow. Wow. Are you ready, Muhammad? Yes. It will be a miracle if a fish will uh, arrive to the water alive, because the starved pelicans are already waiting. Fadal. Now 
we feel pity that we don't have enough for all, but they don't know what we know, that there is another lorry to come. More arriving now, more pelicans. It's sometimes amazing how they fall from the sky, how the information is transferred. The pelicans are protected, first by the Israeli law, and secondly, within the convention, CMS, uh, AY agreement. And uh, this is our responsibility to ensure the survival. And uh, part of it is uh, to be able to fulfill and complete the migration. They are less than 50% of the average normal body mass of pelicans. Males can get down from 11 and 10 kilograms, the normal body mass, to six kilograms and even less, which means these birds are due to die from starvation and no way they will cross the desert and complete the migration. We have a huge conflict here with the commercial uh, aquaculture. So we manage a conflict by providing non-commercial fish, fish that cannot be utilized by human, with less than one mil million shekel per year, much less, we succeed to create a win-win-win-win situation, or I would add another win, because it's the public that you see behind. So it's the fisheries, the pelican, the aviation, the power supply, the public, and the, and the world also enjoying from this. Migration protection is part of a global wildlife project, like the Haibar Yodvata Nature Reserve, which breeds species that have disappeared from the country with a view to reintroducing them into the natural environment. Arik looks after hundreds of animals. The main reason of all this uh, reservation was to introduce back to nature of Israel the Bible animals. One of the Bible animals is the ostrich, in the 80s, they, they tried to reintroduce uh, the ostriches back to nature, but uh, this project failed completely. Some of them uh, were preyed by animals. Uh, they didn't eat at all. They didn't manage to uh, survive with the vegetation that we have. Uh, some of them went up to the mountain and just crashed from cliffs. Today, we are one of the areas that give the ostriches the most natural life because we have a big territory and they can live here uh, almost just like uh, small Africa. And, uh, and again, we don't think uh, our organization or... Ostriches are wonderful creatures, but unfortunately unsuited to the modern world. As a result, they will never form part of the reintroduction program. On the other hand, they'll be able to live in freedom and safety in the country's vast nature reserve. The reserve includes a space that's inaccessible to the public, dedicated to disabled migratory birds. All of this is uh, raptors that can go back to nature. Some of them are without wings. Some of them has uh, hunting uh, bullets inside them and, and they just damage a lot of organs. Today they just live here. Uh, we just give them food and water until, uh, well, until the end of the, their life. In recent years, migrating raptors have been victims of poaching, a problem that mainly affects the peregrine falcon. Maydad Goran is one of the leaders of the anti-poaching unit. It's a, it's a problem that we're facing um, recently, in the last few years, it's growing, and we are quite concerned about this. Uh, we see a lot of these birds taken by poachers, and uh, we decided that we want to prevent that. So I'm, uh, I'm organizing a group of volunteers. They are the eyes. The action that we're doing um, can be a bit tricky, can be a bit dangerous if, uh, if we're not cautious. The season takes about 
Uh, usually it's between November and February when these birds arrive from, uh, from, from the north. And uh, wait a minute. There's a car driving very far. A suspicious car is heading towards a position where birds of prey are circling. But Maydad has to gather evidence before he can contact the authorities. Possibly aware that he's been spotted, the driver makes a quick getaway. Ed, Good. Good. Maydad instructs his team of volunteers to monitor the car he suspects of being driven by poachers. If they drive along these poles, the power lines, and they look for the, for the falcons. A lot of these raptors just been caught for all kind of reasons. Uh, some of them just for, the, for trades, some, some of them just you know, to sell, sell for collectors or, um, or zoos or whatever. Obviously, it's illegal. We just decided that uh, we have to we have to do something. We can't just stand by. These are the fields that attract a lot of small birds and rodents of all types. And these are this is basically the food for the raptors. That's why they're attracted to these areas. And poachers know that too. My honest feel is we are not where we want to, but uh, according to the nature parks authorities. Uh, we help a lot. The Ein Aftat Nature Reserve is straight out of a Bible story. Looking up, we can see an angel gliding down from the sky. With its three-meter wingspan, a griffon vulture makes a smooth landing on a rock. In the last 20 or 30 years, we saw a, quite a dramatic drop in the population of vultures. We're talking from hundreds of pairs to only less, to probably less than 50 pairs breeding in Israel. We realize that there's a lot of challenges that vultures face in a fast growing country like Israel. The power lines developed very, very quickly and the vultures just did not adjust to it. The state has funded the breeding of griffon vultures and their reintroduction into their original habitats. Each of them is fitted with a GPS tracker, which means they can be permanently monitored. There is a guy here. His job is to supply food for the vultures. Uh, we do it also on a sporadic kind of way, so they won't know and they won't get used to feed on a specific site at a specific date. They just work hard to find the food, but there will be always food around, uh, around for them. We really, really fight for the uh, survival, for the survival of the griffin vulture. In the end of October, our rangers were alarmed that uh, quite a few vultures are in the same place and they're not moving. And this place is not a natural place where vultures usually live. What they discovered was a terrible sight of nine dead vultures near a dead carcass of what we discovered lately was that this goat was poisoned and all the vultures that ate it also died from the poisoning. A few days later, three more were discovered in the, in the area. So that means 12 birds were poisoned and died, which means that it's almost like 5% of the population. This bird really, really reproduced very, very slowly. And every, every uh, poisoning event like this is a big hit and a big blow for the population. The battle for the vulture's survival has only just begun. The Great Migration is a natural treasure shared by all humanity, a legacy that every country should protect. Despite the major difficulties and dilemmas posed by the passage of these birds, Israel has accepted its responsibility to uphold this ancestral heritage. I know I'm weird. Okay, I know I'm weird. Not everybody thinks the birds are the most important thing in our world, but they actually are. Without birds, without the services they give us, we can't breathe, we can't eat, we don't have water, but people don't know it. So my job is to try and convince, open the hearts of as many people as possible 
for nature conservation. Some will follow and some will not. Also the people behind this fence in the Kingdom of Jordan, many of them, they want to protect that nature. They understand its importance. Things are getting better in the Middle East. It's not just in Israel, in Lebanon, in Jordan, in Syria, in Palestine, in Egypt, things are getting much better. We need to protect wildlife together. These birds, they know no boundaries.